here we are, my friends. Another episode, another day, another amazing moment together where we all get to hang out. This is On the Road, In the Ways, and on the other side with me, your friend, Paul Carpenter. And uh, today, my friends, ooh, today, today I bring to you an episode that is not just like absolutely on another level, but it is uh, on another level. So I, over the past four months or so, have been involved in this investigative journalism journey with um, a gentleman named Joshua T. Berglund, another gentleman whose name is Jaffe, who has, uh, it's called uh, World Pirate Radio. They're out of Singapore. And um, and me and Joshua have been doing sh- a show together. Well, I don't know, it's his show, but we did like six or seven episodes, these long form, hardcore episodes about uh, everything conspiracy theory to ideas on what we believe is the future, just everything. But what got us together was this moment of this gentleman whose name oh oh, sorry it's out of south korea not singapore thank you jen lizzie thank you um uh, that the thing that got me together with joshua was this magician who is known as um James Heydrich. Now, many people don't know who James Heydrich is because it's from the 80s. But James Heydrich was this, for me, was this formative magician uh, who was moving objects and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And so I jumped into that rabbit hole. And in doing so, I learned about Jaffe and his show. And they had done an incredible back end story on it and like picking out the pieces from the interview that uh, Joshua Berglund had done, which is live on the internet, which is uh, acquiring um, uh, James Heydrich from from his uh, cell in, uh, in LA or in Koalinga. He's at Koalinga Hospital. And the story is absolutely insane. So I don't want to get into the backstory of what's happened here. If you want to find that out, please go watch their content. Because, I mean, when you start to hear this story and what it's really all about, it is mind-blowing. So, I I mean, I don't want to be the one who ruins the, the, the other people's content. Because, man, wow. Wow and wow. So. What I want to do right now is I want to bring on Joshua T. Berglund, uh, and we're going to do a a, a 20 minute between the two of us uh, come up, if you will, of the story without giving away too much from either one of the contents that we're talking about, Um, because there's some really, I mean, they get into it. It's great. Um, And then uh, we will be bringing on uh, James. And we will be bringing on uh, Frank Dukes of Bloodsport fame. Now, the other story that that combines this together, which is just, guys, this this story I'm telling you is absolutely mind-boggling. So Frank Dukes, who's known from uh, Bloodsport fame, is also involved with this story of James Heydrich because they were friends. And they went on missions together. And, I mean, it's... Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So let me now bring on to the table what I a good friend of mine, Joshua T. Bergman. Here he is, and my dogs are going crazy, but here we go. We have a, Josh, we have a live studio audience. How you doing, man? <laughs> how you doing, buddy? You're you're on mute. You muted yourself. Uh, 
I did. I did because the dogs are going crazy right now. And I was trying to actually not have yelling dogs in the background while you were talking. Well, my dog's sleeping like a good boy. <laughs> I'm going to go yell at them right now. Hold on. Give me a second. For the record, audience, our first eight interviews with Paul and I did together, our conversations, the dogs are barking the most of it. You know, here in my studio audience, uh, <laughs> I, I, I do. I have a studio audience. I mean, I'll show you. Look, they're right here. Like they're all just like all <laughs> chilling. I got my little my little one there. Yeah, they're all here. Um, but okay, so uh, Joshua T. Berglund, uh, for those uh, who don't, let, let's introduce you. You are. Uh, you've given yourself the moniker, the mayor of the world. I you have uh, you... myself. Come on. Oh, oh I, you, you didn't breathe. I, I, don't know. I thought you do. Huh? I thought. I mean, that's a great name. I mean, that's. I would have taken. It's. I would have taken that. But we. I don't want to talk about that right now. I want to talk about James. We only have twenty minutes, and there's a lot to get through. Um, okay. You all can check out. Go check out my website. The platform. We have a huge movement that we're. That we're building and we're growing we're creating a world tour but this world tour is not about making myself look good it's about serving in communities it's about serving people that normally don't get access to media literacy education um we are all about helping former trafficking victims even current trafficking victims we have incredible resources i'm very passionate about working with civil commitment prisoners which is how i ended up meeting james um I uh, just am very passionate about working with those that struggle with sexual identity issues, uh, HIV, and then also mental health issues. Uh, these are the people that I am called to serve. Why? Because I, well, I'm, I'm one of you. That's why. Um, and uh, very, very passionate about teaching media literacy. And why am I passionate about teaching media, media literacy? It's because if you know media, you can literally monetize anything. And that's the truth. And my goal is to help people monetize their gifts, talents, and intellectual property so that they can live the life of their dreams, regardless of education, regardless of how much you know and how much money you have. So that's what that's about. But let's talk about James. Uh, okay. So um, I'll, um, uh, let's just let's do a rundown, I guess. I, I really don't want to give away a lot of the stuff that you and Jaffe have in your story, but to give a story, a rundown brief, James Heydrich is a young boy, doesn't have a very good childhood, runs away at the age of 15 uh, from school at around the age of 16, 17. He's uh, kicked out of school and then ends up on the streets of Hollywood on the second day that he's there. He meets Frank Dukes at a martial arts studio, which then delves them into a world of FBI, CIA, uh, MK Ultra, uh, connecting themselves with, uh, uh, let's see, what's this guy's name? Um, Highway Rick Ross yeah. uh, ends up connecting himself with uh, the, the doing the acid tests during the Grateful Dead, ends up doing stuff with the Iran Contra, um, ends up in, uh, in in jail not once but twice, <laughs> both really on falsehoods that don't seem to really hold down to anything when you do the research. Um, so the first incident. He is um, put in jail for two years based on what we, what everybody known as what's called the quote unquote, the van incident, as it's known on the internet now, um, in which uh, James was with a group of boys who end up uh, doing something that was called gay bashing in the 80s. Uh, but he was not involved in the actual process, but he was seen taking a television away. And this is what got him the two years in jail of being involved, being part of. Um, during this time, it is very well known and documented that he gets out of jail, uh, escapes jail cells, bends bars of metal, um, hypnotizes people. And in the last six months, 
and this is where we don't know if this is uh, documented or undocumented yet, but the last six months, there are people who are men in black who have in, in essence sequestered him to the top room uh, or the top part of this jail, emptied it out and have now started to train him to speak Spanish and to work on these covert missions. He then gets out of jail. He then meets back up with Frank Dukes because the first missions that he does with Frank Dukes uh, are never talked about. They, and only just recently did we find out that that's true as we spoke to Frank Dukes on one phone call and we spoke to James Heydrich on another. Um, and so in turn, um, we're now at this uh, place where uh, they go on these missions, something goes really catastrophically wrong at the end and correct me if I'm wrong here, because this is what I've been saying, and I don't know if I'm right here. Something goes wrong in the mission. It had something to do with drugs. Four of the people on that mission pass away. The only two people who are really left are Frank Dukes and James Heydrich. They get back to the United States, and they bring cocaine with them, and they are using children to run that cocaine to Rick Ross. And in turn, one of the kids is picked up and the government gets involved and they convince the boy to uh, say that James Heydrich had touched him and had become a pedophile. Uh, at this point, James goes to... Uh, oh. Am I hosting now? Don't know what just happened there. <laughs> uh, where, where where did you lose me? Uh, boys and uh, and him being accused of molesting boys. That's where we start. Right. So this one, then he goes to court, and this one boy in particular who they use on the day of supposedly says I lied, but it was too late because he had already been committed. And now for the past 10 or 15 years, this same kid uh, is the one who is now an adult, who is now Christian, who is now repeatedly said on, 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 on file that, hey, dude, it never happened. The government pushed me into the situation. I didn't know what to do. I was scared. Meanwhile, James Heydrich's been in jail. He does his time. And while in jail, a new law pops up that says that if you had some kind of psychiatric evaluation that didn't go well for you, and you've been a pedophile, put those two together, you don't get to walk out of jail. You go straight to the hospital, which is our psych hospital, known as Koalinga. And what we're about to talk about today is the essence of what's going on at Koalinga, what's happened to James Heydrich in the meantime. Uh, the attempts on his life, and also uh, when we have Frank here, we'll also have Frank uh, and James see each other for the first time in a very long time. And then also we will be uh, asking Frank uh, some of the questions that we have um, that we're wondering about. Uh, as I said to you earlier today, uh, that uh, when I looked on Wikipedia, it said that there was five uh, boys that he was known as being a pedophile for. I spoke to uh, James on the phone uh, just moments uh, ago before we got on to here. And he said to me, he goes, yeah, it's true. That's what they, that's uh, that I got. I got hit up for five. But when they did that to me, I was under duress and I was also under a massive amount of drugs. Tons of it. And so, and it was the only way for me to go from one to the other. Like I think from I don't some kind of, he wanted some kind of freedom or something. I don't know. And they lied to him. And when they, we got it and that, that's how they used it against Can me. I stop so, you real quick? Cause this please. part is where this is necessary or we're going to lose people. Please. 
it's here's the thing. It's not just about James. James is not just this isolated incident. Civil commitment, it, and if you may have heard of it because of celebrities, because like Britney Spears and stuff like that, or people like that have been under civil commitment. A lot of celebrities go under civil commitment. This type of civil commitment, however, is a chronic problem, and it can happen to anyone. I'm talking if you have, if you get have too much to drink one night, you smoke too much crack, whatever, you're just lapsed for judgment, whatever it may be, and you say you slap someone on the butt. And I, you know what? I've been guilty of doing it. I've slapped my partner on the butt. I, <laughs> I mean, I know when I was a dumb high school kid or a dumb college kid, uh, I got drunk and slapped girls. I may have even grabbed a boob or two. I, I may have. I, who know? Who knows with me? Because I did a lot of bad stuff. The point is this: I'm out of prison. I'm not in prison. And some an incident like that, however. That can get people wrapped up in civil commitment. You can hold someone. If someone accuses you of something, as minor as that, and I know, look, no, this is two, two, 2023. No one wants their butt slapped without permission. I get it. It's a much different world now. However, there are kids that were 16 years old, 14 years old, 15 years old, 18 years old, that slapped other people on the butt or did something like that or never did anything at all that were accused of crimes, but never got charged that have been locked away for 30 and 40 years. MSOP is in Minnesota, Moose Lake. There's two, uh, two civil commitment facilities here. There's one in Texas, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. What I'm getting at is this. All it takes is someone to go point the finger at you, blame you, and yeah. you can get wrapped up in a civil commitment. It's not even a charge. You, you just put off in this hospital and you have no voice anymore. I have interview after interview and testimony after testimony in secret audio after secret audio from inside these facilities that show that medical malpractice is happening to tons of people and these people in the facilities don't care. You, you have to understand that this is inhumane. This is beyond James. Yes, James is an important figure in this, absolutely. But I got involved in this before I knew James. This is a problem and it can happen to anyone. It doesn't even take slapping on the butt. It can be anything. If someone accuses you, you get the right judge, the right jury, and the right psychiatrist, you can get put away under civil commitment. And it is a massive, massive problem. There are people that are innocent behind bars. There are people that deserve trials. There are people that deserve to be heard and they're not being. So this is bigger than James, but the focus is James today because he is a high profile case. And believe it or not, his story, James Heydrich's story, doesn't just tie into Iran-Contra and, and the secret drug trade that our government was involved in. It does. It, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. It ties into immigration. It ties into what is happening today in the world. This story is so big and so complicated, it's almost impossible to wrap your head around it, but it is important because it is more than just James that's being affected. I'm here today in support of James. I believe James is innocent, but I'm also here in support of all of the innocent people that are locked away because of civil commitment all over the country. This is a massive problem. We have a massive slavery problem in the United States, and it's happening right under our noses. People are getting sweeped up and taken away and put into these facilities with no charges, and something has to be done about it because they are torturing people. There are people there with medical problems that are not getting treated, and I don't know about you, but no one. I don't believe anyone deserves that kind of suffering. Even baby rapers, they just deserve to die. But no one deserves to suffer. And people are suffering in these facilities, and it's freaking wrong. Rant over. Sorry, I get very passionate about this. Because here's the thing. I know it could happen. It could have happened to me. It could have happened to many others. And I don't go around slapping people in the butt anymore. I, I know better now. I mean, I'm not an idiot. and I'm not a drunk. I'm sober now. Except, like, cannabis is not a drug. It's a gift from God. But in any way. So the point is this. This is a very important issue. So I pray that all of you pay attention and you listen with an open heart and open mind and not just judge before you hear the evidence. And the evidence is 
overwhelmingly shows that James is innocent, in my opinion. You're muted, bro. <laughs> the dogs, man. It's the dogs. Uh, I couldn't agree more, you know, uh, and, and thank you for that rant. Thank you for being uh, so passionate about uh, what we're talking about, because it's not only just that it's about like an MK Ultra thing uh, and what I call like uh, the ripple effect of what happened with MK Ultra. It's all the stuff that we talked about on our episodes, the stuff that was prior to that, the Eugenic Society of America, uh, the way that the Prussian uh, and the Germans uh, were where we attempted to acquire our school system from. It's so much of these things. And then you see how the government in some way finds these people who are on the edge or outside of the norm or whatever it is and they use them and then as soon as they're done with them they sweep them under the rug you know what i mean and 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 it's it's like if this could have if this would have gone a different way for james this could have ended up as a, a completely different uh, story for him he could have ended up a completely like famous uh magician to this world you know to this day uh, uh, performing uh, like a chung ling su kind of a character almost um so yeah it's 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 i mean he could have been like a, a very much like a uh a yuri geller you know what i mean on some level are you pulling up the book okay um, yeah, of course. Cool. So you just sent me a link. I'm going to show it to everybody. Okay. So this book right here, everyone needs to download it. Because you cannot possibly comprehend mind control in MKUltra and how this whole system works without reading this book. This book comes with a warning label, and it's free online. You can it, it, The PDFs are everywhere. It was written in the late 70s. And it talks about how mRNA, I got to be careful what I say, because this is on Facebook, I think. Um, actually, yeah, there's a section, you can challenge me on this. If you want to know what the last three years has been about, mm -hmm. okay, um, read the section about how the technology and mind control. You're going to notice some buzzwords that are popular today. <laughs> this book was written in the like late 70s, I think. Um, like, if you want to find out how mind control really works, what we have all been succumbed to, and what the last few years has been about, read this book. Read the book. It'll make sense. The sky sprain, everything will make sense. This book comes with a warning label, and I feel led to give you the warning because I was warned before I read it. And let me tell you something. I wish there are days that I wish I never read this book. That is the yep. truth. But I encourage you, if you doubt anything that's said today by me, by Paul, or what's said by James, read this book. Because this book will help you put puzzle pieces together that you never even knew existed. And it, it will make life make a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. Very important book, but the warning labels are true. And it says if you've ever suffered like severe trauma, you have disassociative identity disorder. That's one of the things that I have. It, this book, it pretty much tells you it's going to F you up. And and it does. It did. It, it's messed me up. And I was already a little bit nuts. But this book is very important and it's true. So I just wanted to share that with people because that is the proof in the pudding book. And it's going to show that what we're saying is is is, is totally sincere. real. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're going to see that what we're talking about is that it's real. And, and that's what's going to probably kind of mess people up that they're going to be like, wait, see, the thing is, this is the thing. It's, it's cognitive dissonance, my friend. You can take that down. It, it, it's cognitive dissonance where, you know, people say, I don't trust the government and I don't believe in this, that, and the other. And then two seconds later, turn around and go, oh, but this thing, this thing with this James Hydra guy, he's totally a pedophile. He's totally real. And this, this Frank Dukes guy, he's a total liar. He never went to no coup de cas and he was never involved in none of this and that. It's like, Bro, what do you mean? How, how do you, how do you, how do you jump so far from one from the other? 
You know it's, what I mean? That's what gets me. That's what. I, does the government not lie to you? Does it not the government not use people for experiments without them knowing? I, I, that's what I'm saying. What that's what I'm saying, Josh. We know this to be a truism of life. We know this to be truisms. Okay, so now look, I've got two minutes, and I'm supposed to be on this WebEx thing. I'm trying to join it now. So I might need everyone in the world to be very quiet. Dogs included. Dogs. Oh, really? Dogs too? Are they going to get pissed off about my dog? I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, because here's the thing. I am banned from interviewing James on this so then, now because right. I screen grabbed the interview because I knew that I, 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 how many chances do you get? to interview somebody in prison like James. So I screen grabbed it because if he was telling the truth or lying, I wanted to be able to say, this dude's lying. But I believe him. Okay. 100% I believe okay, him. Okay, here we go. I'm going in now. It says 12 o'clock. It's I have two minutes before the meeting and I'm joining from my browser. So let's just be very quiet for a second. I'm gonna mute myself. Um, yeah, hold on. I've never done this process, so I don't know what it's going to be like. And you're seeing it as it's happening. So, um, okay, here we go. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to mute myself here. Well, no, I'm just going to. Uh, join the meeting. It says I'm in. Hello. Can you hear me? I don't hear anybody. I, don't, I think she's getting ready. I think somebody's getting ready and they're about to, I think James is coming on. Uh, I can't hear you though. Oh, no, it's my bad. My bad. My bad. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I know what's going on here. I have to turn this sound down. I hope this doesn't do a reverb, man. Give me a minute. Yeah, so here's the first thing I want to say. These are the uh, – because this is, this is stuff the public doesn't know about. Are you, you know what that is? You can see it, though. You can see it? Okay. That's – the National Archives and Records Administration, National Archives in at Riverside. Now, there's a provision in here where it talks about Orange County forced medicating me during that trial that is in question. And they wanted to find out whether or not the medication had any adverse effect to my ability to understand what was going on. And this is a year and a half after I had pleaded guilty. You understand that? Once we finish this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer your question. Now, on the next one, I'm gonna show you right here. It talks about, one second. It, it, it identifies the drug I was on, that they put me on involuntarily. 
Hold on. On the drug they put me on, here's a document. I want you to look at that. You see that right there? You see the data? That's a state evaluation report. And this is done by Deborah Inman. In her evaluation, if you see the highlighted areas right there, you see them? Get a picture of it. You can see it says inmate was, rece was receiving Melorel while incarcerated in Orange County Jail in early 1989. That's during the time I pleaded guilty. According to the probation officer's report, he then said the PA, Burt, wanted to remain, uh, that they wanted him to remain medicated to keep him calm. Current medical file contains a form saying that Mr. Hydrate was receiving 10 milligrams and 40 milligrams of Haldol, that's H-A-L-D-O-L, -L, per day and four milligrams of cogentin, 50 milligrams of Benadryl. Now, what do you think that would do to someone who is facing a trial based on Harper versus Washington and Riggins versus Nevada, where it says you cannot, the state cannot medicate an individual and put him on the stand or have him change his plea. Now, I just want to establish that so that you know what I'm talking about before I say what I'm fixing to say. All right. Now, that was appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal in 1992 in a case we're known as Hydric versus Gomez. Hydric versus Gomez. And they said that, well, OK, you were you were forced medicated. But we don't have any evidence to know whether or not you were that influenced your plea. If anybody knows anything about how dog, it was used by the Soviet Union in 1969 to silence political dissidents. If you'll look at the 1969 uh, uh, World Psychiatry Association report from, from Holland. Lulu, you can say that they, you can see that they refer to a how dog as a chemical straitjacket. Now, what is your fir first question regarding the charges in Huntington Beach? Uh, yes, I was indeed charged with those charges. Okay. But I pleaded not guilty when my attorney that they appointed to me tried to get me to change my plea from not guilty to guilty. I told him, I'm done with you. You're, I don't want nothing to do with you. I need a different attorney, a conflict attorney. What did they do? They sent in the jail psychiatrist, Richard Dorsey. Look up Richard Dorsey on Google and look at what he has done. Richard Dorsey talked with me for five minutes, five minutes, and said, because of your skills in martial arts, because of your military training, and because of your knowledge about locking devices, I have to declare you a threat to not only the safety and security of my staff, but the safety and security of the Orange County Jail. So they drugged me with this drug, how dog, for six months until they can get me to change my plea from not guilty to guilty. As far as me, uh, whether or not I committed those acts against the, the four, not five, the answer is absolutely not. I use those individuals to run drugs because our adult drug runners were, were compromised and arrested. And the only thing we had next to do was, was to use uh, the youth that were familiar with that area, well, zone four, which is my area, uh, to run the drugs because they knew how to get in and out of areas. And uh, there were, they knew. And I'll say because I have a case pending right now in the courts regarding that, where the victims have now come forward, and, and Josh T. Berglund already knows that the victims have now come forward and indicated that they were forced to lie. They were forced to lie uh, after 100 
172 hours of interrogation. 172 hours of interrogation. The case right now is in the uh, is in the courts, and outside of that, I can't make any other statements about these cases. I will tell you that they didn't happen. I did, did use youngsters to run drugs. For that, I am uh, uh, duly sorry for. I am I am making amends with these people, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, that's that's all I can say about that. Any other questions you have? Well, oh, I've been locked up 37 years for crime that. That's right. That is actually right. That's right. William Casey, William Casey through me, William Casey. William Casey threw me and Frank Dukes into this. We didn't ask for this. They come after us. Uh, Michael Ruper uh, uh, recruited me in 1980, 1979, 1980, uh, to first do a run into uh, uh, Greece and then into Egypt. Uh, on that run, I, I we carried weapons uh, for the Iranian government for whatever reasons they were wanting. And uh, uh, we did we did all, all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, I did an operation in Athens uh, while I was in Athens, because you go to Athens, you go from O'Hara, Athens, and then into Cairo. So if you, anyone does history, check, check the, be you looking, check your history, it's there. My, my travel uh, uh, path is there, you can, you can document it. I was on the tarmac. Uh, leaving the airport in Cairo when President uh, Amwad Sadat got assassinated. I was an honorary guest of President Amwad Sadat, Sadat at the uh, Royal Palace there in Cairo about 14 hours before his assassination. That's a matter of record. I'm open to any questions you got. I wanted to do this. I wanted to be able to. Your voice is down. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can't hear you. You can't hear me? I can't hear him. It's not our, on our end. It's on your end. It was my end. Go. I'm sorry. My, my, I'm, my, I'm trying to keep it mute. I have dogs running around like crazy, uh, making noise, barking. So I'm trying to keep it mute so I can hear you. That's all. Um, man, when there's nothing recruited. really. Go ahead. When I got recruited in uh, 80, 89, uh, I mean, 90, uh, 89, 99, 79, and 80 by Michael Rupert, they moved me from LA County Jail to the Hall of Justice Jail, 13th floor, 1310. I was the only inmate in that on that floor, the only one. You had Michael Ruper, who was the head of the uh, Special Drug Task Force Unit, which was investigating the crack cocaine coming into LA, uh, and uh, Sergeant Dave Bullis, uh, uh, Sergeant, I mean, uh, uh, Sheriff PJ Pitches, and, and uh, uh, Brother Gerald Schumick. Now, Jeff, Brother Gerald Schumick, as I told you before, was close friends with Bishop Romero. Now, Bishop Romero came to the 13th floor to visit me prior to my arriving in El Salvador, Santa Ana, and, and Nicaragua. Uh, so that's that, and that's how I got involved with that cause because I've always been interested in fighting for uh, uh, the freedom of the people or or being able to run your own land the way you want to do it. Now, when we, when, uh, when we got involved with these operations, Pegasus, uh, Watchtower, uh, Amadeus, and Boomerang, we had no idea at that time the significance of these operations. 
now we um those one of those has been declassified if i'm correct is that which is that, is that correct one of those yeah, four missions you just mentioned classified which is the only one i can speak about is pegasus operation pegasus got declassified and that was as a result of michael rupert and uh uh um gary webb of course buffalo both of those individuals have since committed suicide how that happened i have no idea because i knew michael webb i mean uh, uh i knew webb and michael rupert both gary webb and M rupert both and uh they, they're not the kind of pe people that would commit suicide two gunshots to the head does not amount to suicide and you can see from today what's going on in our world Wait, wait, correct me if I'm wrong. Wait, did you two say two gunshots to the head? head? Yeah. Not one. And that's suicide. Yeah. Not one. Two. How two. do you that's suicide. like the guy, that's like the guy who recently got shot in the chest and in the uh, and in the head uh while he was hanging himself. And that was well, committed that's suicide. Your standard, that's your standard sick head, head uh double shot to the chest and the head is a standard signature in Navy SEALs or any type of special ops on the DOD. So whoever did that knew what they were doing. running the facility yeah i just want to know so what's going, what's going on, on in the facility here is we have a treatment program yeah the facility is imploding on itself we have large numbers of staff members who are quitting they're quitting because they're not releasing people or their desire to treat individuals who need the treatment is being disrupted by the administration who is Brandon Price. You have his emails. I provided your e his emails to you. Um, um, Jen, my, my girlfriend, Jen, who I'm, I love very much, has been working with me for years regarding this. She has provided emails and everything to everybody who's anybody regarding uh, Kalinga State Hospital. We have a large number of uh, Klinga staff bringing in narcotics, phones. We have a large number of staff members who are turning a blind eye to assaults. We have a seventy, eighty-year-old man, men, and body slamming them. We have no oversight committee here. There is absolutely no oversight committee here at all. So. We and it's because of the label that they put on us as sexual violent predators. There's people in here who can't even stand up and walk. There's people here who have no arms. There's people here who are blinded, can't see. How could they possibly be a threat to society? There are people here, uh, uh, Paul, that have been cleared by the court, 37 individuals who have been cleared by the court to be released. And they are still here seven, eight, nine years later. Because they make 400, listen, $437,000 a year off of one individual. Why would you release him? That's the incentive. The incentive is to keep that person here, not to release him. If there was an incentive to release an individual, you would have more people getting released. Now, let me explain how you fall up under this law. If you come to California and you get caught peeing in the park or in the public, you have to register as a sex offender. 
for the rest of your life. If you get caught peeing again after that, you come to Kalinga State Hospital for the rest of your life. They have been 89 patients die in this hospital in the last two years. 89 patients have died in this hospital in the last two years. A list is on the blog. Look at my blog, Kalinga Whistleblowers, blogspot.com and look at how many patients have died at this facility. They're not dying because of uh, uh, terminal illness. They're dying because the staff members here do not care about the people that they're supposed to be caring for. Look at the response in the Just Future Project, the Just Future Project on the blog at the staff members who said, we don't deserve the air that we breathe. We don't, we don't deserve to live. We need to be executed. We should be castrated. These are staff members who still work here today. One of them is on 14 right now, Unit 14, Kenneth Underwood on 14 right now. He's a staff member. He's a senior psych tech technician. What a my question to you is this. My question to you is this. My question to you is this. Like you're saying all these things right now, and there's obviously staff standing right in front of you listening to everything you're saying. And they're okay with you saying it? Yes. Because what they do is they'll take and they'll, you can put in a patient right complaint or you can go to law enforcement support and they'll keep it in a circle. So we, we can never get out of that circle. Our complaints go around and around and around. We can't get out of that circle. And he just got disconnected. Hold on, Paul. Okay, you. I can't see you. I can't see you at all. I got ten more minutes. All right, you gotta. Uh... Okay. Well, anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. There you go. Yes, I do. I see you. Yeah, you're back. So look here. Look. All right. Do you do you see that? We, we want to set up a GoFundMe, but uh, I'm hesitant to do that. But they can contact me at 559-934-0975. That's my direct line. My voicemail is 559-201-6916. Um, if they want to send money or, or uh, flat books of forever stamps they can send them to james hydrick 967-0 at 245 11 west jane avenue colinga c-o-a-l-i-n-g-a california 93210 they can also also contact the legislator of California, Wiener and Runner, and uh, uh, request a view of this law because this, this law is not, I mean, it took them 18 years to get me to trial, 18 years to get me to a civil trial. I had my jury, I had two jury trials. The first jury trial was 10, 10 to my favor. The second jury trial was a 11 1 my favor 
the third jury trial, they brought in these victims who at that time were still agreeing with the DA and used them to testify that I did this, that, and that. And that's what swayed the jury to commit me. Since that time, two of those jurors, two of those uh, um, uh, uh, victims have come forward with the courts and said they were forced to lie. And the victims will be more than happy to talk to any. Josh, Josh T. Berglund, the world mayor, has that contact for one of those victims. And we also believe that there was jury tampering on the second trial. In San Luis Obispo, California, in the matter of, of San Luis Obispo versus James Hydrick. Anybody who wants to get the case I mean, it just, it, it, listen, can go to San it, Luis Obispo. Anybody who, anybody who were to talk to you, James, is would be would be hard pressed to saying that you have mental problems and that you are not an intelligent person that isn't of a cognizant mind it'd be very hard pressed i mean sure maybe you have anger issues or maybe you have this that or the other but you ain't crazy man and you and you know come on man it, it's it's it doesn't matter and, and, and listen was, and maybe and maybe i'm being years. conned by the greatest con of all times you know i want to be a devil's advocate but i don't feel that when you speak okay. to you when you look at your eyes when you look at the way that you you just express the information there's anybody would be beyond themselves to not be able to recognize at this point that it's you know Ask Frank Dukes, ask Frank Dukes how level-headed I was when we faced uh, uh, combatants, rebels in in the valley of the or the jungles of Nicaragua. I'm not. I'm not. There's nothing wrong with me. The, here's how they get away with this, just like they did with the uh, uh, Salem witch hunts. You can't. I. They can say, well, he suffers a mental disorder. He may look, look okay, but. He's not inside. Well, the same thing with witchery, right? He looks normal, but he can put a curse on you. I even had police officers who wrote to Sheriff King and said, be careful. If you look him in the eyes, he can get you to do anything he wants. I have all that in documents. You will not believe the documents I have with some of the outrageous stuff I'm accused of regarding mind powers and stuff like that. Sure. I'm, I'm I spoke to, to I spoke to Bo Keeley for the uh, and I you know he sure, shared documents with me. Re I said I spoke to Bo Keeley and I you know and I've shared and he shared with me documents and ideas and different things that were that were he's covered over the last 30 years. So I mean it's you know he Bo Keeley was my photographer. He went everywhere with me. When i when me and Frank Dukes fought at the Kumates up in, in the Burgess Chan fighting, when uh, Frank Dukes fought down in the Bahamas at NASA, he took the photographs of those fights. I don't, you know, people's going to believe what they're going to believe. Um, they're going to hear what they want to hear. But I tell you now, what I tell you is the truth. I have no reason to lie. I'm not here for a crime. I'm here for a crime I might commit in the future. You should be concerned about that. Everyone in the world should be concerned about being accused of a crime you might commit in the future. Look at the minority report with Tom Cruise. Remember that? If you've never seen the minority report with Tom Cruise, you should look at it. That's exactly what this is. You crime detention right right i enjoyed right. this we can do it again sometimes man i i am so thankful that it's you got right. to that we got it's to hang out i'll, I'll definitely what, what i'll right. definitely set up another one of these where we can where we can chat for a little a, another one you know i really appreciate yeah. you remember remember i see you thank you Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Goodbye. Yes, sir. Bye bye.
<laughs> it sucks that you're we couldn't hear your questions, but it was obvious what your questions were by his answers. Yeah, and I, I what what was going on is that the sound I don't know if you heard once it looped and I was like, "Oh god, what am I, you know?" <laughs> as soon as that happened, I was like, "They're going to find out I'm recording." <laughs> I'm like freaking oh, out. They're find out you're recording um, anyway. Man, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, and listen, Frank Dukes has been trying to come in this entire time. He just sent me a couple messages, and I said, you know, you got to do it on your smartphone or your computer. Hopefully, um, hopefully he will be here in a second, and we can talk to him, and uh, and he can fill us in. And, and, and man, like, like I said, you know, this is one of those things where that's supposed to be a crazy person. He's not a crazy person. No, but that's what they're saying. You know, that, no. that for all that there was, a, there was a guy who came on uh, a post and he's like, why are you giving time to a guy who's a five time committed pedophile? And I'm like, because if you know the story, you'd be understanding that the guy's not a five time convicted pedophile he's a guy who is massively manipulated by the government mm -hmm. and i want i want people to hear frank dukes's story because his mom and dad were part of the cia he was they were part of like the mk ultra era of, of the CIA. and i mean it's such a good story and it's like and it all interplays with the same thing and the same and I wish we, I wish we would have had more time because I would have gotten into the whole thing about uh, when James. I wanted to ask him about working uh, with uh, uh, the acid, the acid test, and, and giving out acid. It, I want to find out more about that, you know. And I mean, like, it's so there's so many things that they're connected to, and and so involved with. It's just. It's either absolute BS, right? And it's just somehow they've been able to string all these things together but because of like maybe one or two coincidences and then they just created this entirety of a world around them and they believe it to this day, which I don't believe for some reason, right? Because there's too much. It's like there's too much honesty. Yeah, and if you tie in, so this also ties into like you know Jim Morrison from the Doors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So his father was CIA, and if you look at the Hollywood Hills, what the Hollywood what took place in the Hollywood Hills, where a lot of these, um, well, famous people live now. Like there's a, a base that's decommissioned there. There's, I mean, the tunnels. The, I mean, the the story of like the CIA and Hollywood. It ties into this loosely also. I mean, it could be de directly related. But going back to that book, Mind Control Slave, it, it hints at some of this stuff, like why they used um, Hollywood, why they use certain people's kids, like the roles that are played, like how these kids get put into the Disney Club. And it, it's... It's all, I know it sounds like it's absolutely. And, yeah, and I know this sounds, and this is totally off. All connected. This is totally off. But remember when the whole thing was going on? Um, I'm, I'm literally on the phone texting with Frank Dukes right now. And he's like, I'm trying to get in for some right reason. It's not working. And using I'm phone? like, man, I'm like, just, are you using a, 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 a smartphone? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, dude, it should work. You know, like click on the link, bro. <laughs> well, no, but he has to use, he has to use Chrome. Oh, Maybe yeah, that's if he's trying to use something other than Chrome, it's going to be buggy. In my experience with StreamYard, this is why I actually don't use StreamYard. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, excuse me, Jeff. No, 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 no. Hey, I'm not knocking. I love StreamYard. I, uh, I just don't use it anymore for one of one of a few reasons. Right. But, uh, I mean, listen. I'm happy with the service. They've been great. Um, I've been I've been I've been blessed uh, with sponsors, um, well sponsorships I should say from people, 
I actually spoke to somebody I had an episode with, and he was like, I want to sponsor one of your episodes. What's that cost? And I was like, what? Let's go. <laughs> uh, so it was great, you know. Um, uh, I'm, I'm still I'm still in hopes. I'm still in hopes. I just sent him the message. It should work. I said, use you Google Chrome. If I have to call um, my brother and tell him that I'm not interviewing his childhood idol, I'm going to be very upset. I'm just kidding, Paul. Forgive you. You're fine, dude. My brother's, <laughs> my brother's, my brother's pissed off, though. He, no, his, man. I, he, he, he's look, like I said. He's definitely trying. Here, look. I'll show you the messages. Where here, I'm, honestly, I'm, you. I'm just saying, my brother believes what he read on the internet, and I keep telling him, I'm like, you don't understand. This ties into a much bigger, more complicated story. And the irony is, my brother's in an. I, well, I, I, can I say? I'm not going to say what my brother does in the military. Never mind. Um, but it was like, wouldn't you know this? Like, can't you look <laughs> into this? But I guess that's not in his uh, pay grade and all that other stuff. But he is in a I, I'm, I'm loving this comment right here. I'm loving this comment right here because a friend of mine, of what I, of what I told him, I'm, I have an episode on Monday, and he says, is this the Pussy Whisperer? <laughs> I like that name, Cool Rock Powers. Yeah, the reason that it does, the reason that I've been saying, the reason he's saying that is because on Monday, I am going to have uh, the famed NLP writer Ross Jeffries, the guy who was the creator of the pickup artist genre, um, and unfortunately, for some reason. It says it doesn't. I'm sorry, been trying for half an hour. For some reason, it's not working. Now, what I want to see if I can do is at least um, I'm going to have him. Well, I'm going to call him here on the computer. Uh, so, the Ross Jeffries, they wrote the book, The Pickup Artist. I, I not know, not, I not no. You're thinking of Neil Strauss. Yeah, Neil Strauss. Is the, who I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm wrote, talking about Ross Jeffries. Hey, how we doing? Hold on. Let me see if I can get this to work, and we can get sound here as well. Let me pop you into the room. Give me a second. I'm trying to get uh, Frank on right now, in whatever way we can, and he's here now. So I want to bring him on. And bam, that should be Frank Dukes on. And then let me bring in the sound here. I don't know if I can hear you, Frank. Can I uh, go ahead and talk for me? Oh, wait, I know what's going on. Hold on. Um, here we go. All right, Frank, can you hear me? Am I on? Hello? Frank Dukes. Holy shit. All right. I, th I think we've got some. Oh, yeah. I can't hear. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, okay. I could, it just reconnected me, so. Okay, is this helpful to you now? We can't hear you, Paul. Again, we can't hear you. <laughs> um, can everybody hear me? Uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, can everybody hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, you can. Uh, now you guys can hear me. They can't. It's woof. You guys can hear me. <laughs> oh, it's going to be so hard. Do you want me to set up a Google Meet? Like, how do we? That's why you do. <laughs> yeah, told you, Paul. <laughs> Zoom? Yeah, Google Meet, Zoom. Can't hear you, Paul. Uh, Google what? 
Google Meet. Okay, so. Um, okay, so. Um, okay, so. Um, what was happening there? I'm trying to bring in a file from one side, use my phone. I'm uh, overwhelming everything. Not fun times. Not fun times. He wants to be on. Um, so what I'm asking you is, do we do I throw a Google Meet and then we just all go there and then I just forward that through here? Yeah, you can do that. And I I don't know if that's going to work with the with the sound. I, I think it's going to start bouncing the sound across. Yeah, uh, you're right. Um, yeah, just like it was a second ago. And I don't understand why it's not working. Why his why why it's not working for him? If um, you know, uh, we, we it, 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 I just brought him on. I, oh, I don't know what to do now. But for some reason, his link isn't working. He says like that link that I sent. Uh, he says, uh, "Sorry, but trying for a while. I've always had problems with this." He said, "Zoom is easy." It is Man, I don't know. I don't, but I don't know that I'm going to be able to feed it through. Well, what you could do is a simulated live. You know what we could do is this. Oh no, can't do that. If we use my Google Meet, all right, it automatically uploads to Google Drive. You'll have the hard file. No, and but I'm live, and there's, you know, we have this thing, and it's already we're recording. What do you want? It's a simulated. I can't. Time. I can't. I don't know what to tell you, man. I, I mean, the 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 best I could do. Oh, what? No, I can't do that either. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. No, I've got an idea. I've got an idea. I think I might be able to do this. Okay. I'll add here. Well, we'll do this. I'll kick me off on this one. Mute that. And I'm gonna kill myself on this one. That one's dead now. Uh, oh my god! Hold on. We're gonna get this. Oh, we're getting Frank on. Don't worry. Don't you worry. Okay, here we go. Let me get Frank back on Facebook Messenger. And we should. I, I think you, you can hear me here, right? I can, yeah. You can. Oh, hold on. And now let me put my sound back on. You can hear me. Yeah. Like, oh, and Frank. And okay. And okay. I think we might have been able to do this. Let me bring you on to the show this way, my friend. And I think people can hear you now, and I believe we can actually see you now. We should have Frank Dukes on. Can you hear her? Frank, Josh? He's not talking yet. Frank, can you say something for me? Hey, guys. Pleasure to be on the show. Finally. Uh, hey! Josh, can you hear me? It worked. We've got a bit of a lag. We've got a bit of a lag here. I, I can't hear. It's okay. Yeah, you might not be able to hear him, but he can hear you. Um, so Joshua T. Berglund is here. We're here with Frank Dukes. Um, and we are talking about everything other than the conspiracy theories of you guys not being real. We're in the opposite direction of you're totally real. You've been totally screwed by the government and or uh, what's been happening with, with all the things that you guys were involved with. And in turn, what's happened is that they've discredited you guys so that they could then in turn make it look like you guys are just complete weirdos that don't know anything and have never been involved, never got connected with uh, these things, never were uh, doing these missions. And anybody who looks you up is just going to point a finger and be like, ha, 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 this guy's not real. So that's what today was all about, was to show that you guys are real, that, that these things have been uh, declassified, that your names are in these documents, that um, 
all the things that people were saying that was wasn't real. It's funny to me because we're in a world today where everything that was we're in opposite world today. So what was 10, 20 years ago where you were a fake and not real today, we're finding out you were real and that the things are and that everything that has has been put out there has been there to push you away, to make you uh, to discredit you in, in every way they can. Of course. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, look, it's, it's power politics. What people, I think, the problem is they grow up with movies, they grow up getting a message, and it, it and they operate according to the message within a certain box framework. The reality is the, all, of, all of strategy in martial arts, I don't care what you come down, read Sun Tzu's Book of War, um, it comes down to deception. Strategy is e equivalent to deception and warfare. And what you're talking about with Jim and me were involved, it was geopolitical warfare, period. You know, uh, what was the interest of bombing you know, the fuel depots and destroying the fuel depots using Peruvian proxies, you know, in Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. Was Nicaragua at war with the United States? Right? You, start, you, you have to start, you know, go, doing a deeper dive. The people who were involved in that, of course, are going to be denied. You know, they have to be denied because of the, the blowback repercussions. It was the, was the effort... So uh, worthwhile, well, yes. But it's interesting today we're working in a world where they don't even care to, to uh, deny it or even hide the fact. Good examples. Look at what's going on in the Middle East. Okay, you have terrorists putting on body cams showing the slaughter of people, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. Because the conditioning of society, the way it's been broken down, it, 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 what, we, what we were involved in was really trying to keep the enemy at the gates. And now you have a president, and I'm going to say it straight up, who's opened the gates to the enemy and letting them in. Okay, whether you like uh, the, the um, what's going on the southern border or not, it's a reality you're, you're going to we're all going to have to wake up to. And every president before us has discussed it and said it's a problem, you know, and that's on both sides of the aisle. It's not a partisan issue. It's just basic common sense, you know. Um, we've been, I think this generation of Americans is, could end the, the entire premise of what this country was built on based on what we're seeing. And it's that thinking that Taking away its heroes, taking uh, attacking people, saying it's fake when well, we actually were whistleblowers and tried to stop stop the pendulum from swinging too far over, right? Um, to where there's no coming back. I mean, that's that's the reality, and you have to understand the reason Jimmy, me, and other people of our generation were denied is twofold: one, to protect us; two. Uh, protect the mission. Three, uh, protect uh, people on the inside compromised by it. And by compromise, I might even mean uh, the uh, the um, infighting that was going on within the intelligence structure. Everybody thinks it's a, a, this cohesive, one-minded thing. And the reality is you have sometimes two different branches in the same agency working against each other without knowing it. Mm-hmm. Right. And this is stuff that's just now starting to come out that people, you know, I mean, it's it, I shouldn't say that it's just now coming out because this is something that me and Joshua talked about. We said, you know, look at the world as it is. How is it that there's so many people that say, I don't agree with the government. I don't believe in the government. And then two seconds later, turn around and be like, oh, no, but these two guys are lying about all of that. And they, how dude? how do you how do you have such cognitive dissonance? You know what I mean? And and, yeah. and and then to go back to what you were mentioning about um, uh, 
the idea of this Western ideology being 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 fought against, which is why you see so many of these people who are, uh, you know, LGBTQ, who are saying, you know, free Palestine. But if any one of those kids were to go to Palestine today, they'd get kicked off of a, a, a building. Oh yeah, you know, or any that they don't any, know. Any, and any, and it's just like it's like they don't know why they're saying, you know, free, free Palestine from the from 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 the to, from the sea to the to the, uh, you know, whatever. It, it's it's like. From the, from the river to the sea. To the, yeah. From the river to the sea, right? And it's like once it, it's like, do you even know why you're saying that? Where is that coming well, from? That you, you to show you the insanity of what's going on here, and it is insane. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's absolute insanity. What they, what they're, what what's going? On. I mean, it's you know, it's like Kentucky Fried Chickens, you know, about to be slaughtered, you know, protesting for Colonel Sanders. I mean, it's like, you know. It's it's a ridiculous situation. Israel is the first de successful decolonized uh, nation in the world. Mm-hmm. It's a decolonization. Yep. Not a colonization. It's just the opposite. Yep. Uh, you I, know, say, and you, I say that all the time. Yeah. Well, you have Arabs living with the Jews in peace and in harmony. The only thing you see trouble with is these Islamic jihadists. These these um, extremists, yeah. but what they really are is a criminal enterprise. People don't understand they're not an Islamic movement. This is a, a criminal cartel that deals in human trafficking, drug trafficking, um, and political corruption. They ripped off the, the Palestinian people, and everybody turned a blind eye based on the PR campaign they're able to wage. That's what's really going on here. We're seeing information warfare. Yeah. People try to fight a war that's an information war with weapons. You know, it, yeah. it, it, the, the status of warfare has changed. We understood that. Jimmy and me understood that way back when because we had to do what we did in the shadows. We had to do everything working with deniability. Why weren't they sending in regular military troops and what have you? Well, you had, you had the military and everybody had their, they were cut off at the knees because of the same kind of political correctness infecting the command structure, you know, where you have to go outside the normal chain of command. And who are you going to get to perform these kind of functions? to protect your country. You know, people forget, but at that time in history, you know, we had two thirds of the globe was communist, Mm -hmm. two thirds. And it was encroaching closely to end the capitalistic system and we would have been living under tyranny. You know, what did I do? What did Jimmy do? We were patriots. We stepped up knowing that we were not going to get the recognition that we should be getting or the protection or the help. You know, in my case, you know, I was operating like, uh, in many cases, like a lone wolf. If I got caught, and I did get caught, I was tortured. Um, you know, it was up, I was left up to my own devices to get myself out of that trouble. Right. Right. Okay. You know, that, that's One the reality. Minute. Sorry. Because you're living in deniability. I mean, look at, good examples, look at Oliver North. Like him or hate him, whatever you want to say, but Oliver North, was a true hero in the sense that he, he was trying to protect the United States based on his convictions, based on what needed to be done, okay? That was unpopular at the time. And he was held up as a sacrificial lamb for it, okay? He was a buffer, the insulator between, you know, Ronald Reagan you know William and William Casey, you know? That's the reality of the situation of what happened. And he ended up being, you know, going to jail for a But what choice did he have? Well, right. honestly. So let's, you know? I wanted I wanted to get more back into you. This is a question that I, I had, uh, I think I asked you over the phone when we spoke the, the first time. Um, yes. Now, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, your mom and dad or one of your parents were involved with the government. They were involved in somewhat with the CIA or something to that effect. My family is three generations in the intelligence industry. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. And then my other question to you and, on that yeah. was, and I and I asked you this before, and you can care to answer if you don't want to, that's fine. Um, 
do you feel that you were as a child and even before being born uh, a thought and uh, that you on some level uh, were a controlled experiment? In, in many cases, yeah. Absolutely. Looking back, how people came into my life, how they pushed me in certain directions, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that was, and you think that, that was based on, uh, and maybe, and maybe not in a malicious manner, right? I'm not because I'm thinking maybe that what it was, it was that your parents were were on some level uh, trying to give you the best by putting you into this system. By, well, because they're, like actually, you said, they're generational, right? So maybe it's like, oh, well, we can put him in, and not only that, he's going to be the first badass super soldier or whatever for ideology, you know, idea. And they're just gung ho for patriotism. So they pushed you through that without you even knowing. Well, I think that's the assumption, but it, it wasn't, it didn't start it out that my dad didn't want this for me. He really didn't. Uh, he knew what it was, what I was walking into and he tried to warn me, but at the same time he prepared me for it. I mean, I was 14 years old and I knew how to take a car at high speed, how to drive a car at high speed. And I could spin it out and put it between two parking places. And that was at age 14. Right. And wasn't it around the age of 14? Uh, and I, I saw, I saw, a, a, there's a guy who's done a couple interviews with you on YouTube. I believe you, you said that at 14 or 15, you were in Mexico. It was the only fight that you ever lost. And there was seven draws, one loss or something to that effect. Yeah, that was, it, it was a control. It was a controlled loss. It's, it, it is part of the learning process. It really didn't count as a loss. Right. In my career. It was it was what we call a planned failure. Um, it's part of the, the of the training when you're when you're being groomed. You know, right. you're, literally, I was groomed, okay, to to, to this lifestyle. Uh, they had a, they had an objective that was a twenty year plan, and I fit nicely into it. I wasn't the only one though. Yeah, no, the, you know, the, the, the same thing that you mentioned, by the way, Frank, is the same thing that they do to uh, dogs or to uh, cockfighting. Um, yeah. They they make them understand that if they lose, uh, that it's it's not just a loss; it's their life, and so they get them within an inch of their life or an inch of their death, so that they know that they never want to go there again. There's another experiment that was done that's somewhat like this that's uh, about rats in water. I don't know yeah, if you've heard this right? So that the rats in the water, after a certain amount of time, will stop, and then if you take them out and then you put them back in they will not stop. They can go like four times longer only because they felt some sense of uh, freedom. Yeah. So, let's say it's the same thing in the training. They take, right. you, 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 you're taken to one extreme. And it's the same thing in life. Look, wh wh why, why is it it's so valuable to maintain combat experience personnel? Because they're used to being in that firefight. They, they're used to surviving it. And they're used to surviving the next one and the next one and the next one. And they build a certain resiliency. And they'll keep fighting where other guys would normally quit and run away. Can Frank hear me? Those are the guys. Those are the guys in, in oh. <laughs> that I find interesting that they want to what? No, you know, no, sorry. Uh, what I was going to uh, 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 can you hear uh, the other person when they're talking? Go ahead, Josh, ask a question. Can you hear me? Can you hear no, me? I don't, I don't okay. think I can. But ask me and I'll ask him. I want to know what it feels like to sacrifice as much as he has for his government, for his family, for his life, only to have that government turn around and accuse him of things he didn't do. That's a great question. So the question uh, is, what does it feel like to be so patriotic and put so much of your life into this government that then turns around and basically ridicules you, tears you down and throws you away? Like, what does that feel like is what Josh wants to know. Well, um, it, of course it naturally feels, it sucks. Okay. It really sucks. But the, the reality is I was picked for the job because they knew that I would be in this position where it sucks and I wouldn't break, where I wouldn't uh, abandon my commitment. You know, I did this not looking for approval. I didn't. I, I I did this because I have a strong belief in 
that we as human beings should have the right of self-determination. That's what my struggle is all about. Okay? That's why it, it, it pains me when I see human trafficking or it pains me when I see someone lying, you know, uh, and getting away with it. Uh, and so many people will be put at risk because of those lies. You That's know, needlessly. I want to make that point needlessly. You know, and you have to understand intelligence work, it's all based a, a lot on deception, posturing, etc. Um, and there's there's a lot more going on. I didn't work specifically for governments. I want to make that real clear. The intelligence industry, everybody's confused. They think that in the intelligence industry, you either work for MI6 or the CIA, and that makes you like the agent. And that's not the case. The real wet work is often done outside any of those agencies for purpose of compartmentalization, purposes of uh, we can get the job done where they can't, mm -hmm. based on long-standing relationships. That's why I was considered valuable. I mean, the, you know, certain persons of operational knowledge wanted access to the network that was available through me, through my father, and through his grandfather. It's all based on relationships. That's real. That's real human intelligence. Now you have electronic intelligence. That's something else. Mm -hmm. But you know, but human intel, the human intelligence factor, it goes back generations. And I had access. I mean, look, if you want to know what was going on in the, in the Soviet Union, for example, you you went through the martial arts arm of 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 the community because what was happening was. Is those are the only at the time when the Soviet Union existed, it was the Russian athletes, martial art athletes, that were allowed to travel throughout Russia uh, freely. You know, people don't understand that. You know, you, we go to a communist country like China. You know, they determine where you're going to live. You don't get to go out and pick a house. Oh, right. They want to live in this part of town. This is what we're fighting for. And these idiots, you know, protesting for these Palestinian protesters. I mean, you know, they ought to sue for their education. They obviously have no education. They, they don't, they can't even think rationally, critically, how their actions will affect them, you know? Mm. You know, what is a jihad? They don't even understand what jihad is. They're calling for the extermination of all life foreign to their own. And, and, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what do you, what, you know, you know, D, uh, remember those people locked in cages, burned alive? No, what I don't get, it, what I don't, what I don't get, Frank, is the people. That's what I'm trying to make my point. I'm trying to answer your question. Yes, sir. My, I face that reality. I see that reality. These other people don't see it. Do I give a damn about being approved by that crowd? Do I give a damn with what they think? Do I even give a damn what my own government thinks? No, because I'm committed to fighting a real evil in this world. You know, I, yeah, I was kind of groomed for it. I was groomed for the reality of what awaited me and how, what was necessary to do the job. You know, that simple. And knowing and recognizing your evil is part of doing the job. You know, the, the hardest thing you can learn and that is to deny empathy. Nobody talks about that. You know, I sit there, I see these guys, and they, 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 they talk about being, you know, this or that, and and I just hang my head low because they don't understand. They don't understand what what it takes, you know, to to live that life, to work in that life, to to steer and protect. A country you know it's 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 uh everybody wants to buy the food but nobody wants to honor the butcher okay yep. and then you go but and then let's go beyond that nobody wants to honor honor the slaughterhouse yeah or the or the, or the guy who's got to gr get connected to them feed them care for them and then send them off to slaughter yeah okay that's the cycle of life we really live in now it takes you a special certain individual 
with a certain training to be able to look at that and understand that you can't have empathy at times to survive. Mm -hmm. That is the hardest lesson. How do you deny your empathy? You know, and, and if you don't have empathy, then you're a full blown psychotic. Yeah. No, I mean, this is just like, you know, uh... you know, and it's the empathy that the, this new generation is experiencing. You see, they, they, they have been sold a message where it is, and this is where I think Hollywood did a huge disservice to, to the country. And I really lay this at Hollywood. They have, they have somehow sold victimhood as a form of status, that if you're in control and you're in power, that makes you the bad guy. And if you're the victim, um, you're, you're, the, you know, you're the good guy. That's not necessarily the case. We're often the victims of our own bad choices. You know, right now, like I've been seeing this a lot lately. So, for instance, there was a video recently of a guy who's he's on the edge of uh, an opposing view or whatever, but he's just filming. He's not saying anything. He's not being disrespectful or anything. All these other people come with these poles and flags and they start hitting him, okay? And the police come to him and act as though he was the one causing the problem. Right. And I'm like, right. they just beat the, like, they just beat the fuck out of the guy. And you're going to say that it's his fault? And they're like, yeah, it's your fault for going and standing over there and causing the problem. He's like, I, he was just filming them. He wasn't even, like, saying anything to them. Well, here, here, here's the thing. What happened to our constitutional rights where he had a right to stand there and film? Why aren't the police protecting his constitutional rights? That's what's really the problem. Uh, you're going to make a – what gives an officer to, to, to make a social decision because that's what he's doing? Oh, you, 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 you're, you're agitating the situation. Therefore, I don't have to enforce it. Uh, no, he's exercising his rights. You know, we've gotten away from from respecting the law as it is. All of a sudden, it's okay to sidestep the law. It's you're justified to break the law. Um, I, mean, I, I think on some level, it's being taught. It's look, we're breaking the laws of nature. Right. Okay. Let's let's I mean let's talk about it, right? Why is a man allowed to to to, to compete in women's sports? It's ins it's an insane concept, yet it's accepted. Yep. Why? Yeah, well, I have my theories. Theory. I have my theories, Frank, on why I believe that's happening. I believe it's all based on the transhumanistic movement and 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 eugenics and uh, the way you do to have the yeah. idea of a perfect human being, yet. It's uh, also the transitional state of that happening. And we're at the very precipice of that transitional state. And so that's what I think is happening personally by the technocratic, by those who are, you know. Of course it is. Yeah. The train, it's, it's George Orwell's 1984 becoming real. Yeah. George Orwell 1984 is an intelligence document. Did you know that? Mm-mm. He was charged with writing what you see the future, and they wanted him as a thinker to sit down and identify what um, thought the future looked like so they could plan for it. Wow. Uh, you said the CIA made him come up with that or the FBI? No, that's from Britain. That's the British intelligence that did that. George Orwell. It's going back years ago. Many, many years. Yeah, no, I'm just kind of searching that idea just to see if I can find any uh, any any kind of information about what people uh, uh, other people have said about that. But he said it himself. Oh, really? Yeah, he listened to Orwell's interviews. Yeah, his Orwellian thought. But anyways, that's that's where it, where it goes. Wow. Uh, yeah, we're moving in that direction. Uh, it's it's interesting that they're trying to stop Trump by any means necessary because he's he's the impediment. He's the 
he's a strong leader and it takes, it's going to take a strong leader to, you know, undermine the globalization of mankind, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and this, and I shouldn't say, I don't want to even use the word globalization. You know what it is? Let's call it for what it really is. The subjugation of human beings. Yep. Okay. Yeah, 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 for sure. So, I mean, do you feel, Subject- so you feel that artificial intelligence and the future of what technology is going to be is, in essence, the subjugation of the human spirit, mind, and soul? I, I can't predict what's going to happen. I can only talk to what's going on. And we're seeing all the indicators pushing us in that direction. They want to integrate, you know, human beings with machines. Mm-hmm. You know, and once you're able to do that, here's here's where question. my here, I, here if, Frank. Here's where my philosophy gets weird. Okay, because I, on yeah. on one level, I'm a human, and I totally agree with what you're saying. But on another level, as a futurist, not a not a technocratic futurist, but just as a, an idea of science fiction and the idea of what it could be, right. I see the genetic code of the human being being something that we can manipulate and that we could change so that we could fit onto another planet or that we could change so that we could fit into a machine that could let us travel through time and space so that when we received the location in the future that we could reproduce ourselves as genetic beings again the way we need to be because on some level and i know this is weird but that's our ultimate gift well i think it's i'm not disagreeing with you i think there's like i said it gets weird frank because when you it's not not weird weird for me because i'll be honest with that's how it reminds me of the remote viewing program mm-hmm. and how that worked. Do, 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 do you know the success behind that program where they put $30 million into the remote viewing program? Yeah, as a matter of fact, there's a really good friend of, well, he's not a good friend of mine, but his, his name is Chris Ramsey. He's a musician and he just did a two part series on the entirety of just the remote viewing part of MK Ultra. And he actually started studying it and he used the techniques from that course uh, and from the, and, uh, and he, he was able to do it and he was able, he was freaking out because he's a magician, right? A guy who does not believe in this stuff is not, right. you know, science, 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 one of those, you know, and I'm, I'm very much the same way, but um, yeah, he was completely taken aback by the, the, amount of clarity and the amount of what he could see um so listen i know that remote viewing is very much real in that respect um and i've said this to other magicians we play on the edge of uh this thing uh called i don't know whatever you want to call it and so we see magic happen more often than not that even ourselves we always say like when that moment happens that's the last trick you do and you walk away because there's right. nothing that you're going to be able to create in your magic repertoire that will ever be that good. You know, it won't, it just won't because what happened was a, a massive moment of coincidence that hit right at the right moment. The card was for instance, here, shuffle the deck all you want. Here's the deck, you know, and you're trying to be cool about it or something. And, um, and then you're like, yeah, now uh, pick a number and the guy picks a number and, and then, okay, count it. And then all of a sudden it ends up on that number. And you didn't set that trick up or something to that effect. And it just happens. You walk away mm-hmm. because there's no way that somebody's going to be able to, like, you can't reproduce that moment again. You see what I'm saying? You can fake it, right. but it, it's just not real. And it becomes even more real because the magician's also recognizing that moment is as well like oh whoa i just did a thing and everybody else is like yo did he just do a thing and the magician's like yo i just did a thing like that was moment i'm out <laughs> you know what i mean so yeah right. uh, uh i mean i'm just so taken aback by the the reality of what we're dealing with with what we're talking about the 
the heaviness of these ideas of these false flag events, the, you know, again, with what you were saying, like the Sung Tzu's Art of War or even uh, The Prince by Machiavelli, how do you keep people um, engrossed within your patriotism, you know, or, or, or how do you keep people uh, without it being forced doctrine, but that, that they plead for you to do it? Very 1984, like you're saying, very George Orwell, very, um, you know. Uh, it, which it was interesting is if, the, if America did fall, I have a 50-50 chance of surviving it only because um, I'm a person of principles and uh, I'd probably be thrown in a re-education camp and said, would I align with the powers? Um, whereas these useful idiots, they'll be marched off to a um, soccer field because once they become disillusioned, they know what they'll become and they'll just they'll kill them all. Right. Josh asks here, uh, do you have any photos of you and uh, and James together? Um, I don't, actually. Wow. Okay. I, I would you know, nobody thought, thought of this things. story. From your you point better, of Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Those days, nobody thought in terms of photos. It wasn't even convenient. They were expensive. You know, people forget that you had to, sure. in my day, man, you had to go out, have a camera, then you had to load it with film. You know, then you had to carry that bulky thing around with you. Then you had to take a picture. Then you had to take it to the developer. Then you had to go pick up from the developer, you know. And then any number of things could happen in between, especially if you're traveling all the time and you're spending three weeks in one country from the next. You're not exactly going to be taking pictures. Yep. You know, there was no time for it. Yeah, um, I know. I, it's, it was a different era. It's a different era. Totally. 100% agree with you. Yeah, um, and, and that's what young kids in this generation don't. I have some photos, you know, a lot of photos I did add. I lost, unfortunately, were due to, you know, moves, due to uh, earthquake, you know, you know, due, due to any uh, like general. Yeah, for sure. But some survive, you know, some survive. I think I've got one photo of Jim, and I'm going to have to find it. I think it's in Chinatown, San Francisco, and he's on a roof uh, getting ready to fight uh, a guy. Or he threw a guy off the building. I forget it was before or after. And the only reason I have the photo is it wasn't taken by me. I took it away. From, I is took that, the camera. Is that the stuff that that got that you got that, that was from Bo Keeley? It could have been. I, I remember just taking it from somebody else. I just it wasn't me who shot the picture. Is what I'm trying to tell you. So my 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 my, my last question for you is is yeah. probably uh, the the beginning of everything. Uh, James tells a story that on his second day in Hollywood, he walks oh. into a dojo. And in that dojo is where you were. And that was the first day that you guys met. Yeah. That, that, I remember that. yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Cool. Because this is the story I want to hear. He said that you guys uh, battled each other that first day. Like you guys had like a, 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 a matchup or something like that. Do you remember? Holy squad. You did you know? spar. So you do remember the sparring? Yeah, we, we sparred. I mean, it wasn't, you know, I, I honestly, I played with, with, with Jimmy because of my size, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and Jim was very quick. And he was, he, he you know, and he used illusion. That's when the, the, I think he performed a magic trick on his way in. It was, I, I kind of laughed, you know. So, and, well, and that, that do, you remember, do you remember by any chance the trick that he did when he came in? I can't. I can't remember. I know he did. He did a trick. That's all I. Or, was it? Was it one of his like manipulation psychic effects where he was like moving a pencil or one of those bits? I think, I, 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 he, I think he did something with a bicycle. A bicycle spoke, running it through his arm, and then he did. He, and he, and he, he did, he did something else. I can't remember what. I just I just have the impression of it. If yeah. that makes sense. You know, I can't remember because I meet so many people. You have to understand along no, the way. They, no, I, yeah, I, the reason that I ask is because it's from that mm -hmm. point that it seems both of y'all's lives completely go on this just absolute, you know, thing. And it, but from what I also understand, you were already doing uh, quote unquote missions 
and then he had joined right. you, and then it was after that that he was trained when he was in jail, and then he joined you again, and you guys go on some stuff together. Well, I would just say we intersect. I, I operate really strictly alone, mm-hmm. but he, he would he we'd intersect. He'd go do his thing. I'd go do my thing, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can't. About, uh, what about the last mission? The one where uh, uh, there were uh, members that passed away. Were you on that uh, last mission? It could, it could very well have been. I don't, I don't know which one you're talking about. I've been in many assignments. I've been on. Yeah. So from what I understand. The, the one where I had to go. Look, here's one I had to go on. They, they had. Uh, we had. Four, there were four bodies. I'm going to put it this way. Maybe this is the what Jimmy's talking about. There were four bodies. They had the bodies. They they were going to use them for publicity purposes against the country as proof. And I had to go in and blow up the friggin' building that had the bodies, so nothing was recognizable. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's what Jimmy's talking about. So yeah, there was this one in which, from what he expresses, it was the last mission that he did somewhere in South America. If I'm if I'm recollecting this correctly, it was him and five other members uh that were on a team together and that yeah, jimmy worked with a he worked with kind of a merc team i worked i worked so i worked uh solo i would you interact don't, you don't think you were on that last one because he says that four of those members passed away and that two of the members him was one of them and the other one i thought it was you he says that at that point is when he came to the united states with the cocaine and at that point that's when he was using the children and he was in touch with Rick Ross of highway Rick Ross. That was the one who created the cocaine and that somehow or another, you three were involved in that process or something to that effect or, 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 or well, the my, end I was, of, the, of his, of his involvement. Well, Mike, I was working against it covertly actually, but it was more about protecting what we call the black economy, the, the funding of, 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 operations um you know I, I i don't know what what jim is talking about because there's so much in the in, in my background and there's so much i, I won't talk about to be quite honestly of course of course of course okay um but you know like uh you know my, my involvement with ricky ross goes to when i was god i would basically go to the van Nuys airport and I would be on surveillance. I was given a machine gun in the trunk of my car, and my job was basically to go to this one spot, overlook the Air National Guard planes that were coming in, and count the coolers that came off the back. And then they would go to a they would go to a uh, hangar, and then then they would be driven to South Central LA. You know, um, they, they, they'd be driven to um, the freeway hotel. I think it was off of the 110 freeway, the 10 or the 110. I can't remember uh, which freeway it is now. It's been so many years, but it was his hotel, basically. And they, they, that's where they would make exchanges. My job was to make sure that everything got went there. And if anything got sidetracked, to make sure it got there. That was it. That's it, right? Wow. And then, and then, of course, there, there are certain difficulties or times. I was asked, you know, my 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 main function in many cases was just basically, you know, watch and report. It wasn't really to do anything. Mm-hmm. Just watch and report, and find out the truth of things, interact, what was going on, confirm, deny, uh, what was happening. Right. You know, for certain situations that when I perceived things were working against certain things I, I i did things maybe unexpected but i thought i was bound by duty to do it uh, i i one of the things was i used to help uh you know after things would go down i'd help uh certain undercover officers give them information on them trafficking narcotics in los angeles area targeting the black neighborhood mm-hmm. i worked that worked against uh, other ringing crack cocaine in and making it secretly, you know, right? right. You know, 
And that's the pleasure because I wasn't a card carrying agent. I, I was free to do whatever I wanted to do. I was just basically, hey, you want my services? I'm the guy you kind of see. You know, it's sort of like a clear and present danger, the Frank character in that movie. Sure. I say it was based loosely on me um, in the sense of he, he's working with the forces, but he's not working with them, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Call it like a gray agent, if you will. He- well, there's, there's, yeah, there, there's, well, there's two, there's several kinds. One is, of course, is an asset. Basically, you're an asset, and you're treated as an asset. And the other one is sort of like Gary Seal was an asset. He wasn't an agent. He wasn't card carrying, but he was an asset. He was used by them. Uh, Don Hull and 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 Owens, you know, they were assets. You know, I think it was Owens who introduced the agents and. CIA to, uh, all, I mean, to Oliver North. I mean, Oliver North to uh, the John Hall and his ranch where they used to fly the crap out of. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it was a safe haven, you know, supposedly for rebels who got shot, they could go there and they would find medical treatment or whatever, humanitarian, which is a bunch of crap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? But in those days, you couldn't say it because it went against the Bolin and Logan amendments, you know. Yeah. So, 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 uh, Frank, what are you, what are you doing now? Do you have, a, do you have a dojo now? Do you have a place where people can uh, hang out with you? Retired. You're retired. I'm completely. retired. I'm retired. I'm enjoying life. I'm enjoying life, and just you know, it was interesting. I was just recently uh, uh, they're trying to get blood sort redone, mm. and. They're, Transamerica, I guess, owns the copyrights. Mark DeSalle claims he owned the, the remake and sequel rights, which he didn't, um, from my perspective, you know, um, because my contract says he gets a sequel or a remake. And uh, when he sold sequel rights to like, FM Entertainment, they went and made like four films after you know, blood sport without paying me. I ended up in the litigation and I ended up with all my life rights back, you know, and they're allowed to make, you know, one remake or whatever. Anyways, is this, the point of it is, this comes from, if I'm if I'm correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, but this comes from a lawsuit that I believe where you won, uh, yeah. I believe $50,000 and also, uh, once again, your rights to your likeness and you also got in the film uh, that it uh, that the film was loosely based on you or something to that effect. They they put some yeah. kind of credit in the film that says something about you and blood right. sport being the, well, it's your story. Yeah. Well, the, what happened is, and you, and you probably see it again. And my point is, you know, in order for the producers to try to steal the property away for themselves, they tried to say it was it wasn't based on a true true incidents in my life. They're trying to say, oh, it's just fictional. And then they got Sheldon Lettich, who, when he wrote the thing, he was obligated. He was a work for hire. Sheldon's been running around telling people, oh, he came up with the story from riding around with me in, in, in a joyriding in his pickup truck one night. Like he presented a script and he, he presented it and he sold it. And that's a just complete lie. He was a work for hire. In fact, I was at every script meeting um, and even helped with the dialogue. And the creation of Bloodsport, but he got so far off track with um, with it that I complained that they brought in Mel Friedman and Chris Cosby mm-hmm. to rewrite it. They put the film back to the original version I wrote, which I registered with the Writers Guild in 1980. So you know, I'm the true progenitor of Bloodsport. If you want to really get there, whether you want to call it fiction or whether you want to call it based on true stories, I really don't care. The fact is, you know, I'm a progenitor of it. I created this, the opening for what became the MMA movement today, you know, took it out of its back rooms. Right. And that's the reality of the situation. And there's people like Jimmy who fought in it and it messed him up pretty bad, you know, again, you know, being in that environment, Uh, poor guy. I mean, they were filling him up with so much dope. I mean, you know, you could have, you could get them to do anything in those days sometimes. Sure. So, you know, it was, you know, and, and, or any time after that. Right. I mean, right, right. 
with with a, with a, with the salt and peppering of doing it for your country and uh, do, you know go get it. Yeah, it makes sense. You know. Um, well, it's you got to understand it's not doing it for your country that's wrong. Okay, I want to make that real clear. And it, no, it wasn't no, the no, no, no. I don't think that that's a bad Let thing. Please oh, finish. No. Okay, go ahead, Frank. Yeah. I want to make this real clear, okay? A lot of people try to spin this and say, oh, our country abandoned us. or people. No, our country didn't abandon us, okay? The institutions didn't abandon us. It's individuals in those institutions mm -hmm. that abandoned us. I want to make that real clear. And a lot of them had personal vendettas against us. Uh, they, they, there's a lot of political infighting when you want to do certain things, when you when you basically tell a guy, I'm going to go do it anyways, and he takes it personal. Mm -hmm. And they're so filled with such hubris and and, and uh, pettiness that they will come at you in, a, in the most cowardly way. And that's what happened with me. I mean, I had my files shredded, you know, uh, denied. And people sit there who knew I worked with, sit there and go, well, I don't know that. I didn't hear that. Mm -hmm. You know, th I mean, that's the reality situation. I was very lucky that I had an uh, admiral step forward. I had Al Martin step forward, who was the paymaster for Iran Contra, identify me. I had the oldest serving officer in the U.S. Navy identify me, who testified that he was I was identified to him by Stansfield Turner, where he was, you know, as, as CIA as, as in my history. And I can go on and on. Right. But am I, am I a card-carrying agent? No. Have I ever claimed to be? No. No. Right. And, and and nor would I would I want to be, right? You know, I've actually worked on behalf of, of of you know with permission, of course, uh, with you know my own government. But I've actually had to go and work with foreign and foreign hours and enemies of our country. That's what my book, The Secret Man's about. Mm -hmm. I went looking for weapons of mass destruction that that believed to have ended up in the private criminal sector. You can't imagine what the the uh, the imperative urgency of that mission was, you know, because it could have, it could have been released accidentally, misperceived politically, and end up, you know, starting World War Three. Nobody wanted that. Everybody was willing to quit this, you know, lay down their differences to end that one. And it turned out. It wasn't really a uh, missing weapon of mass destruction. It was all a scam, which later right. took us to, you know, entering the war with the Iraq uh, you know, in nineteen in two thousand. I wrote about it in nineteen ninety six. My investigation was concluded in the in, in the uh, late eighties. So of what was being planned and what was what steps were being taken, and everything I had laid out happened. So, you know, man, uh, Frank, uh, I, I thank you for everything. I thank you for the time and the energy that you gave me today. Uh, the last couple of times we've spoken on the phone, I really, truly appreciate you, man. Um, and, and, and there was a lot of things that you said today that we all agreed with me and Josh were here. Josh had to take off a minute ago, but, um, he said that your response for, you know, how you felt was like the most perfect response, you know, um, because you were right, you know, on some level, you weren't part of the government, you were you were doing your own thing, you were your own autonomous being, living your own autonomous life. And um, it just coincided that sometimes you were involved with connecting to your government, uh, and giving them services, because that's what they were needing of you. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's unfortunate that they also kind of, you know, pushed you to the wayside. Well, yes, and, and that's a, that's part of the reality, and I knew that I, that was the risk. But that's, you know, that's why you know I, I I knew that when I started, it was it was kind of explaining. You never want to think it's going to be you. It's sort of like you go in the military and you come, let's say, an infantryman. And let me explain it to that. And you, you never do it thinking you might be the guy who takes the bullet. And yet you look to your left, you look to your right, and the people die around you, you know? And then you get wounded, tragically. Right. You know? Right. Okay? 
you never, when you were doing it as a young man, you never thought that could be you. You always thought, I think that happens to the other guy. Right, right. And that happened with me. I just, I knew the consequences of what was going on. And I've got to be a big boy about it. You know? Right. Would I again? Yeah, I would. Knowing what I have, I'd do it again. It, it, it is, is, you know, I suffer for this country in ways you can't imagine. You know, I suffer. I don't have a family because of that. Right. I live with indignity because of the lies. And, and a lot of times I could have proven my innocence. I could have proven a lot of things, but I, but I chose not to because I was trying to protect people or protect an operation's integrity. Mm -hmm. You know, there are other things and factors going on behind the scenes that people aren't aware of. Right. And you right. make choices that I had to make or do things. You know, a lot of times I, I, I have to blame myself. I created situations where I would look discredited. You know, I had to, 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 to survive because the, the need for plausible deniability had to be there. Right. Otherwise, I was going to be taken out. You know, it's living that life where you can separate yourself from ego that makes you a true warrior. That's the difference. True. You know? And remember, I told you, you also have to. You have to separate yourself from empathy at times, which is the hardest thing to do. Have no empathy, um, and, and that that will make a difference a lot of times when you live or die in certain situations. Sure, you know, and I mean, physically, psychologically, and emotionally and spiritually as well. And some of that is, you know, empathy for yourself. You have got to just can't be you can't be throwing a pity parade, you know. Right. Right. And unfortunately, those qualities are not been taught and handed down to this new generation. They're all about victimhood. Mm -hmm. You know, somehow if you're a victim, that makes you right. No, it doesn't. It may mean you're, the punishment is fitting the crime. Right. Yeah, and so unfortunately, the, it's like we were saying a little while ago, it seems as though Anything that, wa that that connects to the Western ideals of, the, of what we're talking about, just simple American ideals. Well, they haven't been taught. They've been taught. No, they're, they're, yeah, they're being destroyed taught. fundamentally from the inside, from colleges, from uh, uh, elementary all the way up to high school and colleges. Well, yeah, look at we, look at the uh, the what was it? The professor in NYU after. For what happened in Israel, and he said it excited him and it made him feel good. That the, yeah, well, you know what they do with the guy. They should the military should grab him, put him on a tribunal, put him up against the wall, and shoot him in front of the public. I mean, that, that, that's that, he's an NYU professor. Or a, 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 yeah, my point. My point is that's the message that needs to be sent. Remember, I told you about empathy and all that. You got to start. You, you, this country, it's going to turn around. It's, it's going to. I hate to say it, but you know. If we continue down this path, it's going to be a violent, a violent reckoning. Yeah, I agree. and it's either going to go one way, or it's going to go the other way. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be a violent reckoning. Mm -hmm. and right now, what's scaring me is that the way the Chinese work is just divide and conquer. We have three hundred thousand troops, Chinese troops, three hundred thousand. That's more than we have in our entire military, as far as infantry goes. Yeah, right in Cuba. Is that I, I'm hearing rumors of 150,000 or more parked outside of Canada. Yep. I've heard okay. the same things. I've heard, I've heard a lot of weird stuff going on. Why the, why the convergence? You know? Well, because we're... we're yeah, all our dots. All our dots. It's thin right now. Look at us. We're half in Ukraine, half over here, one third over there. Man, we don't even know what we're doing anymore, bro. Well, we do know what we're doing. It's it's a lot more than you think. But the problem is, you, you, you're dealing with a military that's been half down. Right. So how you respond? Right. And it isn't. And it isn't like World War II where you're going to get runtime and people are going to get to volunteer, get trained, and go to war. It's going to be. It's going to. This war may be decided in days. Yep. And it may be go nuclear. This is the sad thing about it. Yep. You know, there's already rumbling of Turkey. If Turkey launches on Israel, we may be seeing the beginning of a nuclear war. Nuclear war. But China, this is the thing, unless China intervenes and keeps them at bay, you know? And the idea of the reason we, these leftists or these people have pitted us against 
Russia is because Russia is the is the the check that keeps China in line. Mm. And this is the strategic thing that's going on. So what's happening is you have the Russians being taken out of place and being pushed towards China, which I believe may be, may be planned by China that has infected our our university system. I believe it goes all the way back to the Vietnam War. I believe they saw that chink in the armor and they've been pursuing it ever since. Sure, sure. I think personally it was uh, during, you know, even before, you know, even before that. Like you want to go really, really crazy. Uh, well, of course, we mentioned it. We mentioned it here earlier, where uh, it's it's during the Prussian um, uh, Revolution, where they start to create uh, a uh, education system, and uh, then we we start sending uh, people to Germany to learn that same education system, and then start infecting it here in the United States. So that was way before, uh, you know. Uh, 19, yeah. 1938, not 1934. Uh, it was way before that. So it's crazy. It's crazy, you know. Well, here's the other thing you have to keep in mind, okay? Uh, of how they hunger, what they, how they, how they deal with the most population there, um, was sadly, you know. But the other reality um, you know, I forgot my point. I'm sorry. No, no, you're okay. good. You were saying the other reality. Um, oh, the other reality is that uh, the is the war between the West and Islam only ended in 1924. Mm -hmm. It only ended because of the Industrial Revolution and because we had arms that could mow them down. That was it. We had the airplane. We had the machine gun, we had everything. That's And they, they ended up stopping in outside of Vienna mm -hmm. uh, because of it. And then they were pushed back with the British, you know, taking over the Ottoman Empire. The second jihad, what's called the second infatada uh, that, that happened. And then what we're talking about now is what's called the third jihad, which is right. the idea that the Islam, the nation of Islam in particular, want to take over the earth and put Sharia law all over the earth uh, and yeah, that and bring us back global. to order and under the idea of uh, Muhammad. Yeah, sure. It works in sync with you know, glo a global agenda. That's right. Sure. Um, but here's the thing. A lot of people think the globalist uh, conspiracy thing of the world. No, what it is, it's about uh, being able to capture all the, the natural resources around the plan because that's what really counts. That's what is physical. The money is just a, an idea. It's a, it's a concept. It's paper. It's digit numbers. It's yeah. nothing. Yep. You know, I pick these numbers and you in exchange because you believe in these numbers, you're going to give me something of, of so called value. Right. All right. Okay. But we're really all we're exchanging is a is a promise is what we're doing or a, a intangible. Okay. So the very, very wealthy realize that, well, the only thing that really matters isn't the promise of what's come, because you can change that. You can't change who owns what. So what they do is they create chaos. Chaos manipulates markets. They can go in because they're manipulating the market and, 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 and squeeze everybody out. Mm -hmm. Finally, they own it all. Yeah. And, gonna, and who's going to oppose them? You, you, you know, we had the Sherman Antitrust Act put in place specifically to stop that. The FCC used to require, you know, only 40 uh, publishing outlets, you know, news outlets uh, you could own. Right. But it's only 40. Now you see, you know, people owning tens of thousands. They control the narrative. Of course they do. Yeah. And the, and the, the point is we just need to get back to enforcing the laws that were there to protect us. We need to go back to that. We need to, you know, hold certain people accountable. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm sad to say, but like I said. So what do you think that that's done? There's going to be, look, you can push on the people for so long and you have the silent majority, but the silent majority is hard. And, and people say, you know, I, I laughed at uh, out, of, out of touch Joe Biden was. When he said, oh, we've got 
jets. Uh, yeah, well, those jets are piloted. Where are those pilots going to land? Yeah. And what about their families? And their extended families? What about them? You think they're going to start dropping bombs on their neighbors? Right. And they, or they're going to agree with you? Right. You know, you know, this is this is the reality. Again, we're living with, and if it comes to that, then you've got another nation willing to what strike. Mm-hmm. And what kept China <laughs> is Russia. And what do we do? We the Russian waiting. So you understand? You look at the overall strategic plan. Step back and look at all the pieces, and look at the dominoes and how they're falling into place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to mention, you know, they're even creating uh, swarms of drones which can uh, hold uh, a form of uh, explosion inside of them that look like dragonflies. So, well, not only that, but the, these things can be programmed to identify who they're, they're going after. Yeah, I was going to say facial recognition. So, I mean, they're there where whether we want to fight for them or not, They'll just send, uh, you know, 100 drones after you and run around your house. One explodes, the 99 fly home, you know, and you killed yourself as far as anybody's concerned. Well, like I said, it's, 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 and we get to that point. It's only a matter of time or something, you know, push the button. But mm-hmm. I don't think it's loaded that. I think those are all options available to us mm-hmm. uh, in, in, in limited responses, not massive responses. But, you know, you don't need to, you don't need to, to even fight a physical war. You know, they're winning from an information war. Remember I said this. I said we're we're in an information war. We're not in a we're not in a uh, physical war. I was gonna mention that to you earlier when you said that I you know, there's two different things that I've noticed where the news will come out with media and say, Oh, forty babies were killed and then for two days you have all these people saying 40 babies were killed by the Hamas. And then two days later, the news comes back and goes, oh, well, actually, the reporter never actually saw the 40 babies being killed. And so then for the next two days, you get rhetoric from the other side that says, oh, you see, the media is lying to you. There were no 40 babies. And then two days later, we get another retaction of, oh, sorry, there were babies who were killed. There were this thing, and there was this, but maybe the forty number was a number. Sure, that- because what they're doing, what they're doing is they, they are killing the the reality and the effect. Remember I, the the empathy. Mm-hmm. Remember I told you about empathy. Mm-hmm. That they understand the value of empathy and or the lack of empathy, and that's what they're that's what that's why that's designed that way. Look, the BBC came out and said that. Uh, the um, Israel was attacking the hospital. Yep. Right? And then it came back and said, oh, we have to apologize for our error in, in Reuters. You know? Yeah. That was yeah. error. That, that was planned. That was the second thing. That was the second moment that I saw that I was like, wait a second, two days ago, and I remember seeing all these Instagram posts from all these Palestinian people, all these people, free Palestine, free Palestine. Oh, look. They're killing and murdering the, the the doctors, and they're 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 doing this that and the other. And two days later, it's like, oh wait, you mean they were helping people who were speaking Arabic, and they were bringing in gasoline and and uh, actually trying to help those people to get out of the hospital. It was so they were lying. I, what about the people that were in the hospital that got beat up? And it's like, oh, man, you know, like oh man, it's just such a headache, dude. It's such a headache. Well, God judges all, and and he's it, you know we may think we're working our plan, but he's sitting back and having them laugh because he's working his. Right. Right. And whether you want to believe it or not, that is inconsequential. I've lived through enough to know the existence of something so much greater than myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'd be a fool not to acknowledge it. Right. No. And I very grateful because it's only by the grace of God I'm, I, I am where I am today. Right. It, that's it. I, I can tell you that right now. It, it, there's just no there's no denying it. Right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm old, and I'll put my faith in that and being in the hard lessons, you understand? Yes, sir. Then 
And that's what I can tell these people. And these other people who are running around, these Palestinian protesters, they're godless people. And they and I I, I pity them because they're gonna they're finding themselves alone and unhappy and miserable. Mm-hmm. Well, the good majority of them are gonna kill themselves slowly. Yep. Doing it already. Yep, they are. Yeah. Yep. Unfortunately. And that's the same, unfortunately, for the extremism on the other side as well. You know. Extremist form. Extremism. Extreme is the worst thing we, to be part of. Yeah. Look, it's it's like it's like either you're laser focused on what's ahead of you and or you're off at an angle and the beam, the energy you want to call it, is diffused. Right. People who are off in this wild ass angle and this wild ass angle, they're diffused from from the benefit, from the intensity, from the from the light, if you want to call it the light, all right, and being able to shine mm-hmm. where, where it's going to be the warmest. You understand? Right, right. So, man, well, that's you know, that's all I can conclude. And hopefully man, no, you're up. amazing, man. You're amazing. Thank you for your time today, Frank Dukes. Amazing. You are absolutely a, a, a gem to hang out with and talk to. Uh, I love that you're so honest and free and so, uh, you know, that you have your point of view and you know where you're coming from. It's very rare to see that in today's world. You know, so many people are so wishy-washy. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for being everything that you are. Thank you for your story. Thank you for even even if you're only just a part of it. Thank you for Bloodsport, the movie, and, and, and the idea of even, like you were saying, on some level UFC – uh, I would love to see UFC do something with you, or at least they they at least acknowledge you, or something. That'd be cool, man. You know, like why not? It, it, at least recognize the guy who was, uh, you know, I don't know. I, have you ever done any stuff with like Jean Claude Van Damme, where you were both together at the same place and signing autographs, or is that not? Uh, we did early on. Cool. You know, cool. Very cool. Here's, here's the reality of the situation. I think I got a lot of this. The reasons I have the problems I have is my my life and what I've done and what I've accomplished is bigger than life for most people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's extraordinary. You, you know, and it, they feel threatened by it. you know people who talk credit about you. They're either you know they, they usually either feel threatened by you or they wish they were you. You know, sure. Um, you know, or it it somehow makes them relevant that's it right right you know it really goes on so am i surprised the ufc and all the uh, you know cast me aside uh no i'm not surprised at all you know they've got their brand they've got their fighters they want to you know shine a light on and I, I and i would take away from that so it's a business decision really if people want to really understand what's going on. No, I get it. I get it. 100% get it. No, 100%. You know, but what ticks me off, I'll be honest with you, I have the utmost respect for Joe Rogan. I think he's got some great views. But he sits there on his show and he has like Mustaine or somebody. And all they do is talk gossip and bullshit. Why doesn't the guy show some balls and have me on his show and let me talk to him directly? Why does he, if he's got a question or he's going to talk about me, then do it to my face. Well, you know? yeah. I mean, have you ever reached out? I've, I've, I've tried, you know. Yeah, I, I, mean, I would reach out to the guy. I would find out, you know, find the different couple different platforms that he's on and, and be like, yo, man, it's me. It's Frank Dukes, blood sport fame, guy you talk shit about. I want to come on your show. You've had everybody else that talks shit about me. Let me come on. I'm sure he would. You know, uh, here's something. Why don't you do that for me? You contact him and see if he's willing to do it. I mean, I don't know the guy, but I mean... Uh, I mean, I mean no, you know. I mean, there's got no, to be guys, number. Frank. There's got to be, there's got to be um, someone. You know, there's got. I think if you were to make I even listen, I, Frank, Frank, I, if you were to make I, an I knew, video. I knew somebody who knew his Booker. I talked to him. He said he talked to the Booker, and and nothing came out. So, huh. you know, just just so you know. Well, maybe. I, you know, I would I would make a TikTok video or an Instagram video of you literally saying, uh, hey, uh, Joe Rogan, you know, tag him and then tag the video where he's talking shit about you and saying, I heard you talk shit about me. Why don't you have me on your show so I can be at least, 
Uh, you, you can, you can, you can, you can challenge me live with your computer in front. Let's go. There you go. You know, that's what I would do. And I bet you money, it'll get some kind of uh, publicity because it's you. And if you were to make some kind of Instagram about that, I'm sure somebody would, you know, review it and post it. And, oh my God, look, um, Kuda K fighter, uh, you know, uh, you know, Frank Dukes challenges, uh, Joe Rogan. It's going to go on the news the next day, sir. Come on. Well, you know, I, I probably will do it, like what you're talking about. I'm finishing up a book called Ninjas Are Bullshit. And it, it, it really just, I really expose the racketeering that goes on inside the uh, martial arts industry. Right. Sure. From like the, That's, budding, from the budding small mom and pop uh, Chinese uh, karate, karate uh, well, school yeah, all basically, the way up. Sure. Well, no, it basically starts off with my journey and, and, and ninjutsu and how it, it's a monop how it was monopolized this is a big scam and how and how there's other martial arts that were scams and how the industry was built how, what is it really built on <laughs> the lies what are what are the truths what are the lies uh regarding the industry the history what's really there sure that's dope. and who's, who profits from it and it's, it's it exposes organized crime inside the inside the industry Right, right. I mean, that sounds about right, right? I mean, look at all the, um, you know, I think it's uh, uh, not Jake Paul. Yeah, it's Jake Paul who created a whole new uh, boxing uh, type of uh, fight card you know, company, all in the effort yeah. to actually help pay the uh, boxers because, or even the UFC fighters. And, right. you know, because none of them actually make the money. They all get screwed over and right. end up being like artists from the 1930s uh, that were musicians that were, were getting nothing. You know, they were just there to be the uh, headpiece while the, the guy in the back was making all the money. Right. Yeah, nothing's exactly. changed. Yeah, nothing's changed. Just a new industry. Yeah. Well, my thinking is, you know, I'll have a book to sell. <laughs> make a little money from the experience from playing that card right that's it and that's and that's that's when i want to do it yeah man so, and like yeah i like i said i would challenge joe rogan i would put out a video see what happens i'm sure he'll have you on just because of that alone like you know he's yeah. talked enough shit about you uh you know i mean there's yeah. got to be a way for him and you to come to terms with whatever because i'm sure he's on the side of people who don't believe right so yeah, well, I don't know what side he's on. You know, I'd like to think he's open-minded, but he, you know, he's he, he's 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 a product. He's an obvious product of, um, you know, the computer age. Where if it's if it's online, it has to be true. You know, right, right, right. Well, again, Frank Dukes, thank you so much for being on the show today, man. I really appreciate you, man. All right, my pleasure. Bye, bye. You take care. See you later, man. Have a great day. You too. I, 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 I don't know what to tell you. I, I have I have been absolutely blown away every single time I do an episode. Episode 53, we have James Heydrich. We have uh, the, the one and only Frank Dukes. We have Joshua T. Berglund. Like if you want to have amazing information – and you want to be blown away every single time I have an episode, uh, then then come and watch the show because, uh, my friends, that's what you're going to get every episode. You're going to get another amazing, crazy episode of awesomeness. Did you see what just happened? We just had Frank Dukes. We just had James Burke. What? What? The, what? 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 And I have some surprises for you coming up. Uh, I have, um, let's see, who do I have? I have, a, you know what? Stay here. I'll show you. I'm going to be having on uh, Mark Schiff. He just, I don't know if you can see this. There it is. Mark Schiff. He just put out this book. You can't see it. I don't know why the camera's doing that thing. Maybe I could turn it off. Uh, Mark Schiff uh, is a comedian, and he has been on the road for uh, 
for years with um, uh, with um, yeah, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, Seinfeld. He opened up for Seinfeld for years. Uh, uh, Bill Maher wrote uh, the one of the entries. So did Jerry Seinfeld here at the bottom. I mean, the guy is just a badass. His name is Mark Schiff. This is who he is. Right? Can we see him? There he is. There's Mark. Wee, Mark Schiff. Yay. He'll be on the show coming up. Uh, I have uh, also another awesome one is uh, Ross Jeffries. If you don't know who he is, please look him up. He is the uh, epitome of the 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 granddaddy of them all when it comes to uh, using neuro linguistic pro programming and the art of seduction. Uh, he is the guy that helped create uh, mystery, and uh, he's the reason the book "The Game" by Neil Strauss was written. He'll be a guest on uh, pretty soon here in the next couple of days. Uh, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. So with all of that, my friend, please go out to the world, do something nice for somebody else. And if you can't do something nice for yourself, it does start with you. Number two, don't get caught up in all the crazy stuff in this world because if you do, then you end up a little poopy. That's not good for you, me, or anybody else. And number three, if you do not mind, please like, share, subscribe, send this out to somebody who'd like to see it. My friends, I hope you're enjoying this journey. Huh? 53 episodes in less than 10 weeks. <laughs> what? Um, I know it's crazy. Think about it. It's actually kind of crazy, bro. Even though we're not like right at 70 episodes, we're still at 53 episodes. All long form, all with different people, all amazing. And with that, my friends, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I will see you all on the other side.